you know, we continued to keep trying to bang it out, you know, and the mistake, the failure was we had nearly all of our marketing strategies based on Facebook. Yeah, we did some pay-per-click advertising and on Google and elsewhere, but no, that was not our, you know, that was way too competitive, way too pricey, and that was not our strategy. We had no other strategy, so we kept banging it out at Facebook, and before we knew it, you know, we're we're in debt to millions of dollars to Facebook, and you know, having to stop the running the ads, they weren't converting. And, you know, it's kind of like the business is on, on, you know, we're on crutches compared to where we were. Welcome to Beyond the Fail, the podcast where we talk to leaders and entrepreneurs about their biggest business failures. We'll deep dive into how they overcame these setbacks, the lessons they learned from them, all to help you gain valuable insights. Failure is an essential part of the business journey, as well as being the key to success. So we're here to show you how to thrive from it. Marco Torres is a prolific internet marketer who has founded multiple marketing companies and is currently running marketingboost.com. He's very much a sales and marketing expert, having achieved over $1 billion in online transactions during his career. His leadership also extends to founding a charity called Urban Sailors, aiding veterans in PTSD through sailing lessons. And furthermore, at the beginning of his career, Marco strategically grew a restaurant business from one to five establishments, ultimately achieving a successful sale, Taco Bell. In this episode, Marco shares his entrepreneurial journey, emphasizing the lessons from starting a business with his family, the impacts of mentorship on his career and navigating challenges, including the tumultuous impacts of the 2008 crisis and having kind of wiped him out completely and a candid recount of his time running a marketing business, which was doing millions of monthly sales, which then imploded due to an unforeseen change in privacy laws. We discussed the importance of diversifying risk and how vital it is to make quick decisions in a crisis. This episode reflects Marco's resilience, lessons from failure, and some key advice for entrepreneurs based on his 30 years of experience. This is Beyond the Fail with Marco Torres. Marco, thanks for joining me um, today. Really excited to have you on. Um, How are you today? Thank you, Jazz. I'm great. Happy to be here. Perfect. Um, so, Marco, take us back. Where, where did it start for you in business? I did see somewhere that you said you started your first business at nine. Tell us about that. Yeah, I did. Uh, my dad taught me work ethics from a very early age. There was no allowances in my household. Uh, I wanted a Schwinn bicycle, and he essentially said, look, you can wait till Christmas or your birthday, and maybe you'll get one, or you can start go earn some money and buy one. It's only $150 or whatever it was back then. And so uh, I was like, well, how do I do that? And so he recommended I get a news, uh, a paper route. And back then I had to go door to door selling the paper, the subscriptions, and I had to go door to door to collect the money. And then I had to go every morning, 5 a.m., deliver the route. But by age 12, I had built the biggest paper route my local paper had ever seen. I had uh, a huge route. I had, I had learned an early lesson somehow by accident to leverage relationships. And I had buddies of mine helping me deliver the route nice. in the morning at 5 in the morning. So that I could focus on what I actually learned to enjoy, which was collecting, selling, and collecting. So I'd go sell the paper out and collect the money, which was the best, the fun part. <laughs> and, uh, you know, back then it was a real business. You had to run a spreadsheet. We had to fill in, you know, who owed me money, a manual spreadsheet. There was no computers, no internet, none of this. <laughs> there we go. I mean, that sounds a fantastic early lesson. And yeah. not many people know that or enjoy doing selling at that early age why why did you gravitate towards sales at uh, at such a young age well my dad essentially put the right books in my hand i mean i was uh uh i never was really a reader but he says if you're going to be successful and the first book he stuck in my hand was how to win friends and influence people napoleon hill and then zig ziglar series of books on how to you know knock on doors and overcome objections and close the sales and so i was a very a real early reader on learning to build a business. I went on to be, uh, by the age of 23, I owned five restaurants and a nightclub. Um, 
of which we sold uh, several of those restaurants to Taco Bell when they came into the island of Puerto Rico. We we had so we had secured all the major food courts in in on the island, and then we um, sold the nightclub and eventually went back into sales and then uh, became an early adapter of internet marketing back in 1996. So I've been uh, to fast forward. I've been an internet marketer since 1996. I got involved in uh, travel sales online, and over my lifetime, I've generated over a billion dollars in online transactions or over-the-phone sales driven from the internet. Impressive. Um, lots to sort of dig into there. Why did your dad give you those books? Why was he so intent on giving you that education and, and insisting that you need to firstly, I suppose, learn the value of money, but also that you're able to sell? Well, he wasn't a salesperson. He wouldn't have said he was a salesperson, but he obviously was. And he, uh, you know, he was also a risk taker. And, you know, we, my family grew up in San Antonio, Texas, and he was bilingual. We're Mexican descendants. And uh, he was offered the opportunity to go all the way to the island of Puerto Rico to run General Electric Credit as their, you know, VP of operations and, and development in the, in the Caribbean. And so, you know, our family had never moved out of Texas and, um, you know, all my cousins and aunts and uncles and everybody's still there, and, you know, the typical stay in the community. And he risked and took our family, uh, you know, across the several thousand miles away and unknown little island of Puerto Rico. And um, I had the cool opportunity to grow up there. But, you know, he was like, this is what this is what it takes to be successful. And, uh, you know, it. Maybe in a way, it took me the wrong direction too, because I dropped out of college. Out of a year and a half into college, I, I was not a student. Uh, I, I didn't enjoy being a student. I wanted to be in business for myself, and so I dropped out and, and got into the restaurant business. But, um, but I don't regret that, you know. I mean, but I don't have a college degree to hang me, you know. I don't have a, deg- uh, a you know, mm. any credentials like that. But I've earned my way through life with. Uh, sales and marketing, which eventually took me into being an entrepreneur and uh, successfully building businesses, selling businesses. And then, of course, I've had some failures, which I guess we're going to get to on your show since that's your, Absolutely. your major subject that's, that's, here. That's what you're here for. What, did, what else did you learn from your dad? What else did he teach you? Was he, was he quite a mentor to you at that early age as well? He absolutely was. And at the time, of course, I didn't realize it or appreciate it. You know, he was... Um, um, you know, the ogre that, you know, my mother was always like, you know, quit that or wait till I tell your dad. (laughs) Kind of scenario and took the belt to me quite a few times and all kinds of stuff growing up. But, um, but, you know, you learn later on, especially when you have kids of your own, that uh, setting those standards and expectations and teaching children the value of earning a dollar and the value because you earned it, you spend it more wisely than you would if you just were handed the money. And so I still would strongly recommend it. I didn't do such a great job of that when I had my own kids, to tell you the truth. And that's because my wife and I were not on the same page, you know, when the kids were growing up, which is a mistake. So I'd also recommend another failure to learn from is if you're married and if you're having kids, make sure you and your spouse are on the same page on how you're going to, what kind of this, you know, disciplines and how do you both, what are your values and how you intend to, you know, per, teach that to your children? Because if you're not on the same page, your your kids are going to be all confused as well, which in, uh, in the end, my kids came out great, but but we certainly had some challenges along the way because we parents were not on the same page on how to, uh, you know, rear and provide those those values and that leadership. I think that's a really uh, that is a really great point. It's something uh, you know I thought of it about in the past as well, and it just led me to also think about business partnerships because you know business partnerships are a lot like marriages, and marriages are a lot like business partnerships. And I suppose where have you kind of seen that there is overlap between those two um, sets of relationships? And you mentioned about uh, essentially set, setting um, expectations about managing or I was going to say managing children I meant managing people and children and depending on the scenario and have you been have you ever been in a business um, partnership and 
if you have, if you had issues there about, you know, similar things like, you know, a, a lack of alignment on values or how to manage staff, because everyone has their own way of, of doing things. And it's the same with your uh, example. And it just made me think of the, the business context version of that as well. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, I've always uh, very often had business partnerships in, uh, in, in my life. I found that's a very effective way to uh, divide and conquer. You know, too many entrepreneurs want to do it all on their own. And therefore, you know, don't hire the right people to be in their circle of influence, whether they be hired or whether they are soliciting relationships and partnerships to build a business together. I've found it's, you know, multiple times I've built a business from you know, uh, bootstrapping it where instead of having all the capital and being able to hire high ticket, you know, quality employees, we, we built partnerships with people and, you know, brought in your skill sets as part of the assets to the, to the team and so on. And that, that has worked well for me most of my life. It's also created, like you say, issues where you find out year, sometimes years later, that major, major things can come up similar to a marriage, right? And um, and I think the mistake, the failure there, and there's been some big failures on that because of the battles that can come between partners by simply not having, you know, built too much of the relationship being on a handshake, too much of the, of the partnership not being put down on paper in advance, not having an attorney properly write up your operating agreement and having those values and expectations of each other in writing with with the, you know, again, an, an attorney, not just, you know, a couple of partners putting, the, you know, this is what we agree on, little, having really written out well to protect each other from each other as well. So if the partnership is going sour, there's remedies in writing that can be taken of how to properly, you know, vote somebody out of the old co corporation possibly or move them out of their out, out of their major role and possibly a part of their revenue share because they're not participating as much yet still be a part of the company again all of that stuff should be thought out in advance and you know it's really is hire an attorney spend the money and i've made the mistake of not doing that and paying the price down the road where you end up in a kind of like a divorce court right with you end up in a very ugly situation with partners when it when and if it does go bad. And if it's not in writing, if you don't have everything nice and, you know, spelled out, the likelihood of it going sour is obviously a lot higher. Because if you do have a nice, well-written, you know, uh, series of documents, your own constitution of your business, so to speak, then you, you can refer back to that. You can go, you know, if you had it all in writing, go, look, this is the deal. This is what we agreed on. This is what everybody needs to live up to. Otherwise, these are the you know remedies we can take. Which would you rather do? And thus, you know, a series of serious mistakes that I've made in my past that I would not do again. And uh, formed other companies with partners and doing it correctly the second time around, so or the third time around, and so forth. So that would be a failure and a lesson learned that uh, too many people just because you know you get excited, you make some partners, you everybody's all you know on a ether on how well we're going to work together and you feel your values are aligned and, and maybe they are for years, but things change. People get, get new spouses, people get, you know, changes in their lives and then their, their, you know, values might change and they shouldn't, but they might, <laughs> yeah. or, or their commitments change or their involvement in other business opportunities get involved and they're t giving less importance to this one. Or worse, taking you know, doing a, a extremely you know, uh, you know, wrong things for your company, moving you in the directions you didn't want to go, so to speak. So, yeah, no, absolutely, That's some wise words there, and and the, I think the reason why I was also asking is because I've had a number of guests on the podcast talking about implosions of businesses because of implosions of their business partnerships, and um, I think everything you said is echoes what they learned from from those some of those harsh experiences did you start the those five restaurants with a business partner great question yes with my older brother who was my partner there and my mother who was mexican and um that was a uh and my father he was involved in helping us find the financing since he was in the finance with general electric credit but he also gave us some big lessons back then which was if you guys really think you want to be in the restaurant business Prove it first. 
go work for other restaurants. And we did what we, today is called funnel hacking before there was such a thing. But we went to work for restaurants. We moved back to Texas, lived with my uncle, went to work at multiple restaurants, Mexican restaurants all over you know, San Antonio, where the best Mexican food is. And we were in, uh, you know, working at restaurants. We were picking up the midnight late shifts we, so we could be in there by ourselves, mopping the floors, taking pictures of everything. You know, so we had those little cardboard Kodak cameras you could turn on, you know, switch the, to the next film and snapping pictures of the, you know, the inventory sheets, the equipment, the branding of equipment, the materials they ordered, the layout of the, of the kitchen equipment, uh, recipes. I mean, we literally were... Uh, incognito spies taking uh, learning from every uh, ver variety of restaurants coming back and meeting the next days or whatever you had putting our whole plan together and eventually we were able to r launch our own mexican food restaurants without buying into a franchise which we also looked into and found it to be too expensive but we launched with one in the biggest uh food court in puerto rico the, uh, that was launching at the time back in 1979 and that blew up our business. And from there, we were able to, you know, open five restaurants in five years. Plus, the, later on, I broke on my own and I opened the nightclub of my own with another partner. So, again, I've had rela partnership relationships in probably every business I've, that I can recall that I've op opened has always been with a some colleagues involved in the mix because I, I don't want to do it all on my own. And I like sharing the responsibility, you know, uh, having the ability to divide and conquer with people that have skin in the game that are partners versus all employees, especially, you know, at the top. And of course that can be a mistake, right? You pick the wrong partner, but again, that's where we, we talked about earlier, if, it, making sure that you've got rules in place and expectations for everybody. And something you, um, well, yeah, something I kind of wanted to dig into was, you, you know, you went into business with your family, which, you know, some people, maybe put off um doing so how was that experience well <laughs> it had its pros and cons of course yep. um i mean my brother and i you know we live we one of the restaurants we opened up was in saint thomas u.s virgin island and that was some amazing experiences we're both very young i'm 21 he's 25 or whatever and we you know have a restaurant right on the waterfront in in the Virgin Islands overlooking the water. Uh, we are, uh, you know, living in some beautiful homes in the Virgin Islands with incredible views. And But, you know, he's he's gay. I'm straight. Um, we lived in the same home together. We had uh, worked together. It was a very unique uh, relationship with, you know, business and family, with everything that comes with that. And so, yeah, we had our challenges. We had, our, we had many uh, a fight. Um, my father, again, later in life, you know, he ended up getting involved running our books on the back end. He ended up having to retire from GE with, uh, with, uh, but the timing was perfect. If we had to open the family businesses, he ended up having to retire from a heart attack from his business. And then he could, you know, he sat back and helped us run the paperwork on the back end later on. But the family business ended up supporting the whole family because, you know, he was no longer able to earn the money he did previously. All right. With his uh, role as his, as a uh, with a big company, and although he had some pension money, it wasn't enough. So, the family business turned out to be something that carried us on for eighteen years with the oh, family really? businesses. Yeah, before we uh, started selling them off. How, so, eighteen years. So, um, those five restaurants that sold to Taco Bell was there more uh, more enterprises that followed up that. We had uh, one of them that was a full-service restaurant in St. Thomas that did not fit the Taco Bell model. That wasn't wasn't the others were fast food inside the food courts, yep. and the St. Thomas one was a full-service sit-down restaurant bar, the whole thing. And so that one is the one that lasted the longest with us because we kept that longer, and we eventually lost that to a hurricane in the Virgin Islands. Um, but uh, by then it had it had it had certainly lived its course and had done well for us for many years. So we didn't rebuild it after the storm. Uh, we, that was kind of our exit plan right there. The, the storm did it. For, <laughs> I mean, the storm did plan the hurricane. <laughs> yeah, the storm did it for us. And we lost the roof and the whole thing. And it was like, you know, we don't need to rebuild this. We just need to walk away. So. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, sometimes you just 
take those those opportunities i suppose um yeah in terms of running that i mean it sounds like you know the the family business the family dynamic was kind of very successful and i'm kind of interested to look at what we were talking about earlier in terms of like partnerships and partnerships going wrong and um having all of that paperwork in place that you were sort of um, advising people do how did you make that family and dynamic work how what mechanisms did you put in place to be able to successfully run those businesses for such a long time with your with your family members well there wasn't you know a, a perfect uh model for that it was it was like any family you know uh, good and the bad and the ugly um my f uh, mother was probably the glue of of keeping relationships between us like she always had pr you know prior to business and after the business and uh my father was the the driver of demanding expectations of you know perfection um we never lived up to it, but that was the family dynamic there. And, um, you know, mistakes were made along the way, the way as well. But, um, you know, part of what drove me, you know, to to bounce off of my family business, so to speak, even though I still had my part in it, but to focus on something different was the uh, those challenges of family relationships. And so I bounced into my own nightclub uh, opportunity. And, you know, I read a book recently from Patrick Bet David of Choose Your Enemies Wisely. I love the book. We recommend it to anybody. And when I think back on my life, my enemy was my, 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 my hero, my mentor. At the same time, my enemy was my father. Right. And what I, what I mean by that was he could also be very demeaning to me like you'll never make it if it wasn't for me you know with the family of dynamics for example he was like if it wasn't for me you wouldn't even have a job with the screw-ups you make and this that and the other and so i was determined to uh you know go launch something on my own that didn't depend on him and prove to him i didn't need to be a part of the family business that was my idea in the first place i didn't want to go to college and I dropped out of college and convinced my family, hey, let's open a Mexican restaurant. Mom, you can cook. David, you just got back from college. Let's open a Mexican restaurant. And, um, uh, you know, that's where it came from. But that's because I didn't want to go to school anymore. And I'm like, let's, you know, let's open a restaurant. But, but anyway, my dad got back and got involved. And he was really, you know, just driving me to want to, to leave almost. And so uh, I opened the nightclub. And it wasn't but a year and a half later or so, I came back and, and it, I asked him to audit all of my books um, for my nightclub. And, of course, my motivation for that was I wanted to show off. You know, it was like, check this out. Check these numbers out and tell me how I'm doing. <laughs> Did it work? Oh, it was great, you know, because then he couldn't believe the, the cash flow that we were generating, the profit margins we were generating, you know, the... The nightclub business is totally different than the restaurant business. In other words, we, we were selling booze, man. You could plus charging money to get in the door, and uh, so there was all kinds of cash flow. Uh, back then, it was more, much more cash than credit card transactions. So it was a big profit machine. That when I'm showing that to my dad, you know, later it was like a, a way to legitimize my, you know, begin to show myself and to him that I could do it. And I went on from there to do a lot more, but uh, he's no longer with us. He, he passed away early at 65 years old. Uh, I'm getting up to that age and hope I make it longer than he did. But uh, anyway, that was one of those motivations, right? Sometimes you have to find, like the book says from, uh, what's his name here, the Patrick Bet David, finding your enemies. And what he means by that is choosing your enemies is he teaches, and I believe it now that I realize it, you know, that was motivation, right? Having somebody, what what's the fire that gives you that motivation to go out and build your business? And you better have that fire. Not that you just want to make more money and I want to, I like to make more money. My goal for this year is to raise more money. No, if you really want to reach those big lofty goals, then you need an enemy to drive you. That enemy could be your you know, father who's no longer with you. That enemy could be your ex-wife who's driving you nuts. That enemy could be your ex-partner. That enemy could be, you know, the government who's, you know, you don't like the rules that they and all the restrictions they put on you, and that's your fire to make it with or without the government, et cetera. So 
read the book. I recommend it and find your enemy that can help you boost your business. I like it. But what's in that? I mean, it, you know, you said a couple of things earlier. One, you said um, that the you and the family didn't live up to your dad's expectations. You also said he could be quite demeaning and, and say kind of quite nasty things to you. Wasn't that quite difficult to, given that he was your mentor as well, wasn't that quite difficult to hear? I mean, didn't that affect your kind of like self-belief and confidence? Absolutely it did. And it was part of that, uh, you know, you'd leave a meeting like that with your dad and then mom would, tip, you know, come on and, and try to appease you, give back, you know, lift you back up. You know, you can do it, son. You know what you're doing. You know, just just improve your paperwork for your for your father. It was really, from on my father's side, it was all about the paperwork we were turning in and the deposits and the don't you know where we you know was the payrolls and the payroll numbers you know accurate and clean and versus having to have him clean up all of the you know the uh, this that and the other and so he had an accounting background and of course people like me that are on the creative side we are you know. Everything is all over the place, and yeah. yeah, there is no organization. And then, you know, so I'm on the creative side. I'm on the sales side. I don't ask me to. And a mistake I maybe never made was I needed an assistant. You know, I learned one of the things I teach people today is don't do things you're not good at. Hire virtual assistants. I should have had somebody doing all that paperwork for me, turning it into my father nice and clean like he expected. That was something I was never going to do well, and never have to this day. So it's like. Um, uh, you know, find what you're good at and focus on that. And anything that should be done every day on an ongoing basis, like accounting work, should be outsourced to somebody who does love doing that. And uh, therefore, you can run your business from 10,000 feet above versus working in the business. You want to work on the business. And uh, that was a mistake I was making back then. I was doing everything my dad, you know, asked me to do, but I was terrible at certain those, some of those things, you know, like handling all of the payroll reports and the deposit report, whatever, all the you know specific paperwork stuff, the inventory numbers and accuracy of inventory of the restaurant. When I was good at what managing people, customer service, uh, PR relationships up front, you know that kind of thing, which uh, is obviously important part of the business as well. But I was trying to do things that was not my skill set. But didn't he have a yeah, did it have any other impacts on you? That that kind of um, what sounds like a slightly at times tense relationship. Very tense. Uh, again, it um, at the same time though, it did, you know, once I went on to continue to run different businesses outside of the family. You know, I did learn. I did take away the necessity to have uh, proper bookkeeping and proper uh, organization of invoices and you know inventory and everything else and so um the back end of the business and knowing your numbers of a business is imperative and uh can be very costly if you're not you know you know including something is making a decision to give a 10 percent discount as a promo idea when you you know maybe you don't even know your numbers to realize hey you're barely making 20 percent uh, net profit at the end of the day after all your expenses, after your overhead, your rent, your mortgage, your this, your that, your other, you have a 20% net profit. So if you discount 10% for a promo, you're giving away 50% of your profit. And now you've got to double sales to end up exactly where you were the day before. So is a 10% discount the way to go? And I would say absolutely not. You need to find ways to add value instead of discounting. And uh, again, you don't know that unless you're really really on top of your numbers. And that's the kind of thing, in the end, was one of the big takeaways from working with my father in the early years as a young man and uh, uh, moving on from there to continue, you know, eventually opening up uh, a lot of online businesses that have done well. Yeah, I mean, obviously, attention to detail and um, knowing your numbers is, is, is definitely key as a, a business owner. And you mentioned about uh, starting a nightclub because essentially it sounded like you were forced uh, out of the other business or, or you were you needed to uh, make a point. And 
did you ever succeed in, in essentially proving proving that point to him? Yeah, I sure did. I mean, I did, I did leave working for the family business for several years and um, bounced away from that. I mean, I kept uh, my ownership percentage, but the you know I didn't want to work for the family dynamics. And I opened up the nightclub with a partner also in San Juan, Puerto Rico, and that uh, you know turned into a, a huge success for several three or four years. As uh, a nightclub business, if you get into that world, there the the it's a fickle community of customers, and it's a, typically has a life cycle that I didn't know going in. But uh, a successful nightclub bar business typically lasts three to five years, and if that, and then there, there's a new a new club that opens or a new bar down the road, and the crowd will be whoop this is the hot spot. No matter what you do bringing them back to your place when the new hotspot hits, you know, combination of timing, luck, you know, new trends, what have you, new look and feel of the new club. So you often, one way to survive that is to close down, remodel, reopen, you know, with a new look and feel and try to bring back a new young, a new crowd and maybe a different crowd or what have you. So, um, but anyway, one of the failures there was interesting. Was trying to hang on too long. I mean, I had a, uh, I made it almost to the front page of the newspaper, which was not a good thing. I had a riot breakout inside my club, wow. big fight breakout, um, and uh, you know, the people all over the street because a big fight uh, fight broke out, and and uh, it, it was never the same after. You know, the, with the crowd, we lost a lot of crowd in the you know bad word of mouth. Sometimes you say, you know, any advertise, any any any, you know, advertising is good, but no, but it, this one wasn't. So we never quite recovered. So uh, I sold my half of the business to my partner, which was uh, uh, the the best thing I could have done because six months later, you know, it was he was gone, he was out of business, um, which is not a good thing for him. But it worked out well for me because I was the marketing arm of the business, you know. So I. Um, in that case, I was focusing on all the promo promos, the radio shows that getting, you know, another event for the next weekend, a big event here, new, you know, bands. We bring in bands from the United States and bring them into the club. But the, the mistake in the end was hanging on too long without shutting down and rebranding. Uh, eventually we failed and, you know, the business was, was gone. But um, again, one, one lesson there, especially if you know you're in a, or, you know, studying the industry you're in and realizing Will it last forever or do you, is it cyclical? Is there, you know, do you need to rebrand? Do you need to shut down after a period of time? Invest again in, you know, a whole new look and feel. Hit the market again. And and that can be, even if it, regardless of what your business is, you could kind of turn that into, are you innovating? Are you bringing in more? Because if you're not growing and changing and innovating and adding more value to your clients along the way, you're going to eventually lose the clients you have and people will, you know, and it doesn't always happen. There's some bars and clubs that have been in business for a hundred years. You know, they have the right location, the right traffic, the right crowd, and they get famous for that one look and feel that pub feel or what have you. And they're just been around for a hundred years, but that's not always the case. So. You yeah. I mean, it can't be many industries that have to either rebrand or, or kind of shut down, you know, three or five, three to five years. Yeah, no, that's not the norm. It is the it is the norm for the nightclub uh, life cycle. It's not the norm for other typical businesses, right? They'll they'll, uh, but you know, you see it on hotels. You'll see a hotel brand would be one uh, one flag on top of the brand for ten, five, ten years, and then flip it over. They reinvest. They remodel the building, and it went from. Holiday Inn to Hilton, you know, and so on. And so that's, uh, it can make a big difference in spiking traffic again. And so depending upon your industry niche and what you do, uh, you see restaurants, sometimes they go out of business and sometimes they're not, you know, they're, it's a time to re remodel and either not necessarily rebrand, but a remodel can be do, do good after, you know, X amount of years and so forth. Freshen things up. And you see it with, even with McDonald's, right? McDonald's locations can be get stale, and make the, you know they'll come in, and the franchisee or the owner or the fran company will come in and 
shut down and remodel the whole place, modernize it, coming up with the whole new look and feel. And now you got all the push button orders instead of cashiers. And so rebranding and not rebranding, but remodeling or adding the Mac, you know, McDonald's added the, the, the Mac cafe, right? The, the, they have the, That's true. the coffee, the coffee shop to them. So they're re, they've kind of rebranded or restructured offering a new, a new hook to get people and younger crowds into the place and compete with, with Starbucks and have their own coffee brand, Mac, Mac cafe or however they pronounce it. And, um, you know, that's been huge for them. It's just a question I had, and it's, it's sort of um, be useful for people to hear, I think. You started in business. Obviously, we've talked about the, the, the first business when you you know had that um, huge paper round that you kind of grew. But then you kind of, you know, started running restaurants and growing restaurants really quickly, you know, when you were, as you said, sort of 18, 20 what gave you that strength, that confidence to be able to just to be able to do that? You know, I was fortunate in high school to uh, be chosen uh, in, in my acting department to be chosen to um, to lead, have the lead role for a musical called The King and I. It's a pretty famous uh, a musical, The King and I. And I had they gave me the role of Yul Brenner. So I had the role of the king in high school. And so. You know, that was about seven months of practice and what have you before we did the show. And then we had this made huge auditorium and sold out the thing for three or four nights in a row. And, uh, you know, that I, I walked around for the rest of that junior and senior year with uh, after brainwashing myself after seven months of practicing this work. My stance was like that of the damn. I find myself every now and then standing with my legs spread, my arms spread. You know, standing there like Yul Brenner, you know, practically saying, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, the level of confidence that that did for me as a young man that I could, you know, stand on stage and deliver the lines of a uh, play. Uh, the following year, I had the lead role of another play uh, from West Side Story. And I never knew, you know, that gave me a level of, con of confidence that made me unstoppable. You know, it's like, I can I can deliver lines, you know, and I realize that that's what that's part of what being in business and being a salesman and and what have you is all about. I, today I still preach that you're, you know, a lot of us fear sales. A lot of entrepreneurs, individuals, we don't even like salespeople sometimes, right? Because we're like they're too pushy and this, that, and the other. I don't want to be that pushy salesman. But at the end of the day, you need to be, you know, as the leader of your business, your company. Uh, whether you're the one actually doing all of your frontline sales or leading others to do it, the main thing is you're always selling, and that's the part that people don't understand. You're, you're a salesman whether you like it or not if you expect to be have any kind of success. You need to be selling yourself, selling your brand, selling your staff to be the salespeople for you, what have you. But that belief factor, you know, you need to... Uh, Believe in yourself enough and prepare yourself like an actor on stage. And I've always taken it back to that. When when it's come time to sales time, you've got to put yourself and think yourself as an actor. The the curtain's opened and it's showtime. And can you go out and deliver the lines? Uh, for example, in the family business, the restaurant business, we'd, you know, my brother and I might have been fighting at the back of the house all morning. We might have been in the office in the back yelling at each other. But then when it, time to open the restaurant at 11 a.m. and the noontime rush comes in, you know, we've got to be able to put all of our family issues behind us instantly and put on the smile and it's showtime. And now we're meeting guests, greeting guests, seating guests, selling our products and services and doing it with a smile and with the right attitude. So you can't, you know, carry your whatever happened to you 15 minutes ago once those curtains opened up. It's can you be can you deliver your lines? Can you deliver? And of course, those lines become, you know, in business, they're no longer acting, right? You learn to love your lines. You love your business. You're passionate about it. You know them by, you know, you know your, nobody knows your business like you do, or you, obviously nobody should know it better than you. And can, you know, can you sell that now convincingly to the person you hire, to the salespeople you're training, to the, you know, uh, where you're, when you're being interviewed on a podcast or whatever, can you deliver the lines and make and, and deliver the uh, the message 
of your story, of your of why people should follow you, why people should buy products from you, and um, why they should invest in you, or you know, et cetera. Every time you're doing something, you're you're selling. And I think um, I've heard that, and I, you know, having worked in hospitality myself, I think it's true. Is some of the best people in hospitality are often actors because they're able to, uh, you know, to as you say, put on that show um, and put whatever else is going on in their lives behind them and put on that that front and um, to give the great guest experience. Exactly, and that you know, I, again, I was fortunate. I didn't even want to be an actor. I was like. My girlfriends in high school were like, "You got to try out for the play. You'd be perfect for this, you know, for this play." And uh, I was like, "Well, I don't know. I'll go give it a shot." But uh, and I had no intentions of getting in the dep- art department. I wasn't playing football. I was one of the lead football players, and that type of thing. And so going to be in acting, I, I had no interest. But if it wasn't for that girlfriend pushing me, you know, and the, re- and the funny thing is, the reason she was pushing me to go take the role of, of, of to apply or uh, try out for the role of the king was her ex-boyfriend was was likely going to get it. Her ex-boyfriend was the guy, lead guy, was probably going to get the, the role of the king, and she was pushing me. You've got to go and try it. You'd be better. So it's basically so, rivalry, see? <laughs> yeah, it was a rivalry. Yeah. And I got the part. That dude hated me ever since. But, um, but... Uh, but it changed my life because it, you know, I, I never knew that I could do that. And uh, so I'd recommend the parents out there as well. If you've got kids, uh, get them in there, get them in the, uh, get them on the, the acting, you know, drama department, mm-hmm. get them, get them to learn how to learn to read, to memorize and learn lines and deliver them and act them on stage. It's a lifelong, uh, they don't have to become great at acting, but it's a lifelong lesson to be able to, Take those skills, you know, whether it be singing in a choir, it's, you know, it's, um, those are lessons that are invaluable. And singing as well, you know, because it's when we communicate, what we're communicating is sounds, right? When we're selling, when we're talking, when we're passionate about a product or service we're delivering, we, you can say those same words and be monotone and boring about it, or you can learn to sing your message in, in how you deliver those lines with voice inflection, et cetera. And all of that is learned in the drama department. So get your kids in drama is one message I'd have for you. Yeah, no, that's great advice. Are you a singer? I play the guitar and sing a little bit. Yes, I'm not great at all, but I do, uh, you know, in, in, in the shower maybe. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just, uh, yeah, you were talking about singing and singing your sales uh, lines, and I thought, oh, uh, um, yeah, that that is a good uh, analogy as well, I think. So just fast forwarding and I suppose diving into um, your failure story, really, and you talked about it um, kind of offline, gave me a bit of an understanding, but um, do you want to sort of share it? It was the um, the book VIP website that you wanted to talk Yeah, about. I'm going to say, which one do you want to hear about? <laughs> So, yeah, but after, well, I can tell you this, after 2008, which was a mega failure for, for me, I had, uh, I jokingly laugh now, Jazz, that 2008, 2009, I had one of my best sales years ever. I mean, uh, I failed so bad in business in 2008, 2009 with the worldwide crash of the economy. I lost my, I sold my home. It was a great sales year. I sold my house, my cars, my boat, my furniture, my jewelry. <laughs> And went really to the bottom of the barrel and came back up. About 2010, however, my partner, I got together with partners again and 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 and, and uh, reached out and leveraged relationships that I had from prior to the 2008 clash. Put together four guys that we were, you know, friends and we had skill sets each of us brought. We didn't have much capital between us, but we launched a company called BookVIP.com and it turned into one of the fastest growing travel sites in North America. And that was blowing up for years. We were growing it, growing it, growing it, uh, all the way until about 2018 or 19 or so when um, we were spending, I mean, we were spending up, you know, during those first seven, eight years, we spent about $65 million, rather, $65 million on Facebook ads alone. It wow. was. It had turned into our... And of course, we obviously had a good ROI, or we couldn't have invested that much money on Facebook ads. But it was an 
easy, easy operation to post and run our Facebook ads across the, 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 the world and driving traffic and driving sales to a hundred person call center in the Philippines and just really blowing things up. When uh, suddenly iOS, uh, the iPhone, uh, Apple decides to change their uh, operating system on all of their iPhone devices and I, uh, what was it called, iOS 14 comes out, iOS 15, privacy policies change with Facebook completely. Um, and now the Facebook advertising overnight doesn't work. We can no longer target the individuals, the demographics, the communities of, of people that we wanted to target. Of course, we lost when by losing that on the iPhones meant we lost the top 50, you know, 50 percent of the users worldwide typically approximately have an iPhone versus an Android. And so now 50 percent of the target market, we can't target anymore. We can't reach them the way we used to by, you know, d demographic markets or where they visited before, target them based on this, do retargeting and follow them on the Internet where they because they were on our website was we could stay in front of them in which all that type of thing wasn't working anymore and it wasn't working for the top 50 percent of the the users i mean the iphones are more expensive the you know and so forth so it was the the more affluent audience that we lost overnight as well and that didn't just affect us it probably affected every internet marketer out there but you know we continued to keep trying to bang it out you know and the mistake the failure was we had Nearly all of our marketing strategies based on Facebook. Yeah, we did some pay-per-click advertising and on Google and elsewhere, but none of that was not our, you know, that was way too competitive, way too pricey, and that was not our strategy. We had no other strategy, so we kept banging it out at Facebook. And before we knew it, you know, we're we're in debt to millions of dollars to Facebook, and you know, having to stop the running the ads, they weren't converting. And, you know, it's kind of like the business is on, on, you know, we're on crutches compared to where we were and um, facing, you know, not wanting to, um, to lay people off, kept fighting, you know, we'll figure things out, we'll turn it around, we'll do something else. And, um, you know, again, losing money and, and not making the quick enough decisions to say, well, since things have changed this quick, we need to, you know, reduce our staff, we need to cut back on, eventually we forced to, right? But uh, early on, we should have made those moves faster. And so that's the kind of nimbleness, you know, when things are, when things happen to you. The first lesson is try, try to have a multi, a multi finger uh, approach to your marketing. Don't have it all in one basket. Don't keep, don't make it all Facebook or TikTok or YouTube. You know, you've got to have a little bit of everywhere so that if one of those platforms goes down or worse in today's world, if they kick you off the platform because they don't like one of your ads or what have you. So anyway, that was a huge mistake. So and, what, what, what was the percentage of coming through um, Facebook ads in terms of like your, the amount of leads that you were getting and the amount that were coming through from, um, from Facebook ads? Probably 90% was Facebook. So, oh. so when you lose that, you know, it was, we're left with 10% of, of the business that was working profitably. And uh, of course we didn't, it didn't completely die, you know, uh, com but it, it's the profit margins were, you know, it, that died because we kept throwing too much at it, trying to say, well, we still got to be reaching people. We're just not reaching the same targets like we'd like to. And matter of fact, Facebook still works today. We still use Facebook for marketing today, but, but, you know, we're nowhere, it's not scalable or as, as, as it once was where we could just keep going at it like crazy. And of course, that's the, you know, the other lesson that's to be learned from it. Okay, here's the positive side of all that happened. When you find a home run, okay, worked for us for years, right? So when it quit working, it quit working. But when you find a home run, then throw gas on it. Don't be afraid to throw gas on it. We were, when we found the home run, man, we were fired up and we didn't just go like a, maybe a big corporate company might where they're like, well, our budget for Facebook is 50,000 a month. So we can't go to 55, you know, well, if you're generating, if you're putting in $1 and spitting out four on the other side, then, you know, borrow, steal, whatever to start throwing 
throwing more money at it so you can keep throwing $5 bills out for every $1 you put in, for example. So if it's working, you need to go at it, push it, put more money at it. Like if you're just like when you're winning in the casino, you got to put more money, put more money, put more money, keep winning, keep winning, keep winning. When it changes, then pull back. And of course, our, the, the failure I'm talking about is we didn't pull back fast enough. So when it, when it stops, you know, don't, don't, then you got to walk out of the casino, right? You got to learn, learn to walk away, keep what you've got and find another avenue. So we didn't do that fast enough. I mean, we, we didn't fail completely. We didn't go out of business or anything like that, but we did lose a lot of money continuing to try to turn Facebook around. And um, we should have been trying with a whole lot less money. We should have been gambling on the roulette table with a lot less with, with, you know, $1 chips instead of $50 chips, you know, et cetera. So, you said you had a million a million dollars of debt to Facebook. Why did you have that debt? Is it because you couldn't pay? You didn't have the cash flow to pay for your ads? Right, because we got upside down in the sense that, you know, we're throwing, and we literally, I mean, we could we used to be able to do a million dollars, you know, a week. But here we're, we're getting, we're, time's going on, and we're still throwing money at it. We're throwing less, but... We're not getting the sales on the back end. We're not firing. We're not, you know, cutting back on staff. We're not trimming the fat everywhere else, trying to keep this going. Didn't didn't start finding new advertising uh, venues or looking for other partnerships. Going back to focusing on affiliate marketing, for example. Going back to email marketers. You know, different avenues. There are other ways to get your message out, but we kept going. At, hey, Facebook has been, you know super profitable for us forever how can this how can this stop overnight so we kept at it and then before you know it we're like shoot not only can we not you know pay some of these bills here and there now we're in debt to facebook for over a million dollars and um uh have to you know and they're not gonna let the ads keep going anymore until we pay up and then we're like ooh, cash flow is tight here and everywhere else so you know we had to pause all the facebook ads there for a while until we could climb our way out of the hole and pay that off and get back to advertising, for example. So, yeah, it was um, a mega failure on continuing to try to win in the casino when you're on a losing streak, so to speak. And business is exactly that, right? You 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 play your, ad, your marketing dollars, your advertising dollars like a casino. You put a little bit out, and if, you, if, you, if it doesn't work for you, you change strategy, you know, out of, and when you find it hits, that's when you got to double down. Uh, when you've got a winner, double, triple, quadruple down. And then learn that when it's not working anymore, obviously, it's pretty obvious now, but we didn't figure out for some damn reason, we didn't figure it out at the time. <laughs> <laughs> but, so, you know, that was, and that was good. And that was going to be a question because you talked a lot about um, essentially not making decision quick enough. Why do you think you didn't? Because we didn't have other successful outlets of marketing. So um, instead of spending our time and brains and marketing efforts and and gambling on new venues, we kept trying to see if we could get Facebook to work with the new rules, with the new iOS 14, iOS 15 you know, um, restrictions. And um, we w would have been better off, for example, saying, okay, we're pulling back here. It's working 50% of, like, you know, less than it used to or 70% less, and we got to spend 70% less money. And we're going to need to take some of that money now and start gambling more on, you know, YouTube ads, coming up with YouTube, coming up with TV, coming up with radio, coming up with email marketing, coming up with uh, whatever else we might have tried at the time. But we we failed there because we weren't being creative enough to look elsewhere and kept trying to um, kept trying to you know kind of like I, I relate it to to gambling because I enjoy gambling as well. But <laughs> um, you know I love the craps table and the casino uh, and there's a lot of excitement and thrill at the craps table. You know you're putting money on the line and you're throwing the dice and when the when you're when you're on a roll, if you know the craft game, when you're on a roll and you're throwing numbers and you're throwing numbers and you're winning on every roll, 
you uh, it's an adrenaline rush and you're just loving it. You know, every every roll of the dice, as long as you don't throw a seven again, you're cashing in here and cashing in there. You're betting on the hard eight and you're winning on the hard eight and all this stuff is, is working for you. And then, you know, you're bound to luck is going to turn on you and you're going to hit some sevens in a row and some craps and everything else. And um, that's when you need to be able to walk away from the table um, or start reducing your 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 bets dramatically because you're you're no longer hot right so just like that in business if you're not hot don't keep you know do it slight do it slow do it slow invest slowly test smartly look for it you know um, ROI versus you know in, uh, quick response versus um, branding. Most entrepreneurs should never be doing any marketing for just branding and hoping you get your name out there and eventually it's going to start converting. You really need to do everything based on a direct response, you know, instant sales and conversions and especially online. You can measure things a lot better than you can anywhere else. So um, uh, it's harder than ever to advertise on the internet today because it's so competitive and everything else. But on the other hand, with the internet marketing, there's a lot more trackability and if you set up tracking properly with everything else, and you can uh, you can measure your results better. And that's interesting. So I was just about to ask a follow up question around that, and you've mentioned tracking. Were you uh, m uh, monitoring and tracking closely enough your numbers at the time? Because it sounds like you were doing big volumes of everything, big volumes of ads, big volumes of sales. How quickly did it take you to realize that things weren't working anymore? Oh, it was pretty quick to realize it wasn't working. That didn't take as long. Um, so you were tracking them quite closely then? Were you tracking your numbers like on a daily or weekly basis? Yeah, yeah, we yeah. definitely, daily basis, we had, you know, our team of people that did our, our, our managed our marketing. Um, again, the we just kept telling ourselves, we're going to, we're going to figure it out. We're going to figure out the new algorithms. We're going to figure out the new restrictions here. There's, there's no way we can't reach iPhone users on Facebook, you know, and so on. So we've got to be able to get to them. It's just we're not going to be as effective at it. And um, but it doesn't take long when you're when you're advertising forty, you know, thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars a day or what have you. It doesn't take long to for that to go too long if you're not if you're not converting, if you're not driving in sales and, and immediate ROI. Yeah, which is why I'm sure you had a cash flow issue because, like, yeah, that is, you know, when you're spent that high. And when the the, the legislation got announced that they, they were, or well, I think it was prompted by legislation, but since you went Apple announced that they were bringing in this, this change to the iPhone, how long did you have to anticipate that change? And do you think that, you could have done more to think about the ramifications of those changes on your business. Yeah, we could have, uh, but there wasn't a whole lot of heads up coming to to the industry at that time for the first round of that. And if I recall, it had nothing to do with legislation other right. than than Apple deciding to. Uh, well, there was legislation being pushed around. There's lots of talk on governments around the world on on how Facebook and other um, platforms were sharing personal information you know it was it was more negative negative pr for these big uh firms that that all you know privacy information was uh, was being sold to marketers like me you know and and everybody else out there marketing on the internet that we could you know we could target you by income we could target you by age we could target you by uh, demographics of where you lived we could target you by what your habits were where, where you like to shop previously where you where you've traveled before previously, you know, they had every information on you. So if I wanted to market vacations in Cabo San Lucas, Mexico, I could target people that, you know, went, went there last year. And I could target, you know, all kinds of demographics information that, I mean, we didn't know specifics. I never know John Doe was the one who went to Cabo last year, but Apple did. And they could, you know, uh, or, or Facebook did rather. And so Facebook could say, hey, let's, advertised to people who went to Cal Mexico last year. So we could go, they went to Mexico. So I might want to go again next year. Or, or they were last year they were in, you know, Punta Cana, the Dominican Republic. We can market to them again. They might want to go back. Or 
they're going to see your ad and say, I don't want to go to Punta Cana this year, but I want to go to Cabo. So, you know, but we know they're travelers and we could know, we would know that they were travelers. We would know that, you know, anyway, that information is not as easily available. It's not, um, it's at least for the iPhones anyway, it's not available anymore um, to Facebook and therefore it's not available to advertisers like us and others. So it really, you know, we weren't the only one that couldn't make it work. Uh, we might have been one of the few that, you know, kept trying. But but we were, everybody, you know, we all the forums out there, we were, you know, we were reading the forums. Everybody's trying to figure it out and everybody, and everybody was failing, only we were failing faster. Um, so, you know, there's some things in life you have, you have no control over. That was one of them, for example. So the only control we could have done was scale back and try slower, you know, try, continue to try, but not, not with the same budgets we were previously. Yeah. And that was going to be a question I asked as well, because you, you mentioned about essentially you didn't, you didn't cut your costs quick enough. So therefore you went um, further into debt and that obviously caused you um, more cash flow problems. Again, why didn't you make those decisions kind of quicker and, you know, potentially lay off staff and, and cut your costs? Probably just pride. Um, you know, you've got a business doing X amount of millions a month in sales and you have built up a staff that's worked for you for years um, and you're not quick to want to, you know, lay off 30, 40, 50% of your call center staff that have, you've invested hundreds of thousands of dollars in training and building them up, you know, over time. So you're, it's, it's painful to think, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to lay off all these people. And of course that has other consequences. You know, you've got labor laws that you got to deal with in your country, whatever country you've got your staff and we had our team in the Philippines, but we have, there's labor laws in the Philippines that are intense. So when you lay off all these people, there's, there's uh, lawsuits that can be filed. There's, there's, uh, uh, you know, forced, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Pension, not pension, but uh, uh, help me with a word. But anyway, uh, it's forced. Yeah, I, I, yeah. Payments yeah. you got to make, you know, to, to lay them off, you're going to have to pay them with X Redundancy amount of pay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And there's, you know, things like that, or if not, lawsuits you're going to face and have to hire lawyers and end up having to pay anyway. And so the, the decisions is, uh, they get difficult, you know. How many people are we going to do this to? How quickly are we going to do it? Can we recover? Can we figure it out before we start laying everybody up? Um, and so I would, the lesson learned there is, again, try to, Make sure your contracts are lined up in a way that you can lay people off faster. Um, understand that business might require you to do that. You know, you, you, we're always, I think my partners and, and I, we were too optimistic. We're always, you know, to be in business, you need to be an optimist, right? You can't be a pessimist typically. And you need a, sometimes having a, at least one pessimist on your team is a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody who's always the got a Somebody who's always looking at what worst case scenario is a good idea to have around. But but if you're always thinking on the worst case scenario, if you're the type of business owner or don't have an optimist on your team, then you're also not the gambler who's willing to take the risks that's required to be in business as well. You need to be a risk taker. And you need to know when to, like I said earlier, double down and everything else. But you need to know when to pull back. And pulling, but the challenge with pulling back, like I just said, it wasn't just spend less on Facebook. It also meant if we don't have the revenue, we don't have the sales coming in, we're going to need to cut managers. We're going to need to cut staff. We're going to need to cut, uh, you know, all kinds of stuff left and right. But employees are the ones you have emotional relationships staff with. You have, you know, relationships with your staff that you've built over years. You have investment in training these people that if you did figure it out and you bounce back and now you've laid a bunch of people off, you've killed, the, you know, your credibility. They don't want to come back to work for you. You know, there's um, there's uh, all kinds of risks involved in laying people off as well. You know, the word gets out, your company's in trouble, you know, especially like in, in, in the Philippines where, you know, it's a call center community and they all talk and speak. And so if 
if the staff is thinking, oh, these guys are going to go, and then nobody wants to come work for you because, you know, amongst that community, they're like, they just fired 50 people last month. You know, I wouldn't go back there, you know, on and on and on. So, so were these some of the things that and the discussions that were going through you and your partner's heads? Absolutely. Yeah, we weren't just blind to this. You know, we kept, we kept, uh, you know, just digging into our reserves, so to speak, figuring we're going to, we'll fix this, we'll figure it out. And, and then little by little, you know, the accountants are saying, you know, you're not going to figure it out. You need to make some changes ASAP. And uh, so we did, and we're still in business and so forth. But it hasn't, we've never been the same. So as far as that business is concerned, we then focused on a, a totally different direction since then. That uh, is our pride and joy for since 2017. I do want to follow up on that because I know, uh, yeah, I just, but I just want to ask something. You you mentioned about, um, you said the word pride. Pride, you know, you were thinking about, you know, you didn't want to potentially lie off people because of pride. But it also made me think, given that you'd had such a tumultuous 2008, 2009, losing, you know, um, by the sounds of it, quite a lot of money and, 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 and potentially some scars and having to sell off your all your possessions and things like that. Was that in the back of your mind as well? Did you kind of think this is history repeating itself and, um, you know, you were kind of maybe thinking the worst and you maybe were trying to ignore ignore some of that? Yeah, possibly sticking your head in the sand syndrome where, you know, I, I don't want to admit that this might be occurring and, um, you know, uh, it did come to that, you know, to another, similarly, right, this, when this happened, when it came to the point where, you know, we shut down, we had an office in Miami at the time, not only this big staff in the Philippines, but we had a 10,000 square foot office in Miami. We had a big U.S. based staff as well in Miami. And um, of course, you can imagine the rents in Miami, mm -hmm. payroll in Miami, the U.S. based staff uh, versus an overseas staff in the Philippines. And so, you know, eventually we. Uh, that was one of the first cuts that we were delaying the pain of cutting off your nose to spite your face, so to speak. It was the pain we didn't want to accept was real. And yeah, then when it started to become real, it was it was very, um, it was pretty damn scary because again, it was reminding me of in my late 40s in 2008, you know, I'm thinking I had reached, I mean, I lived in a neighborhood right down the street from Tiger Woods in Orlando, Florida, in a neighborhood called Windermere. Um, I was, you know, I thought I was doing great. I was reached the pinnacle of success. I've got, you know, multiple, all kinds of stuff. And uh, and felt I was secure and diverse enough. Uh, 2008 wiped me out. And next thing I know, I'm, you know, again, I told you jokingly, I sold everything, you know, it was great sales year. So now I'm back into that and I'm in Miami now and I'm shutting down the Miami office completely. Uh, let the entire U.S. staff was first to go. So shut down our whole U.S. operation because obviously it's the highest payroll and and overhead and rent on the facility and you name it. So shut that office down, shut, you know, laid off a bunch of the staff in the Philippines, um, reduced the size of that operation and stayed in business. But it was, you know, at... Um, um, you know, painful, if you follow me. And that's the kind of thing we were pushing the delay of that, you know, while we searched for and rebuilt other marketing strategies. But they weren't coming. And we were trying, but they weren't, you know, they really weren't coming that well. And we didn't want to give up on, you know, we didn't want to accept we're losing, we're, you know, we're losing here. And so it was kind of like you're, you're in a football game and you're in the, you know, Second half is not going well, but you're determined to turn it back around. You're determined to stay at it until the fourth quarter. You're determined to get down to the last two minutes to see if we can't, you know, turn this game around. And uh, I guess there's sometimes in business when you need to throw it to towel. <laughs> I know uh, or no wind, you know, when to walk away again, when to walk away, when to change, a mega changes and, and, and face the pain quicker rather than, wait till it's, um, you know, it's become a, a cancer. Is that uh, a kind of 
trait of yours in terms of you know not wanting to quit and probably clinging on because i think you mentioned it earlier that in one of your early businesses potentially the fam one of the family restaurants you said you held on kind of too long and you also mentioned a similar thing here is that yeah is that a trait that you just you don't actually just want to give up probably i mean i'm i'm not a I don't think you get in business to be a quitter. No. And so... But you said it different. I mean, obviously, I've you know phrased it wrong because obviously it's not about quitting per se. It's about exiting at the right time, right? And, you know, your hurricane uh, restaurant, you know, you exited it uh, at the kind of the right, at the right time. You got given that exit. But sometimes, you know, it, it might be that there might be conditions in the market or in your business that actually you may need to make a change or or exit completely or, or pivot. Yeah. Um, well, that's a good point. You know, um, I, I might need to see a therapist about that, but I, I may have had uh, that, that issue in business where you get emotionally attached to the business. What, you know, for example, I've never built a business uh, on purpose with the, with an exit plan, um, you know, for example, we did sell some of the restaurants to Taco Bell, but that wasn't our plan going in. Our plan going in was we were gonna we were gonna create our own franchise product and sell franchises uh, uh, around the country with our branded name and so forth. But um, uh, then later, you know, at least we made the right decisions there. For example, with that business, we looked at the fact we had been in business. We had seven year leases in all of the malls that we were in. And some of our two of our biggest leases were we only had like less than a year and a half left on them. And um, and we knew Taco Bell was knocking on the door to the mall management uh, wanting to get in. So there was a risk that they wouldn't even they wouldn't renew our leases. Um, so we, if we stayed in business, you know, hanging on too long, hanging, uh, we could have faced the fact that, you know, they might not have renewed our lease and we'd walk away with nothing. So selling at the time that we did with a year and a half left on the two major leases of the malls they wanted to be in, you know, we were able to get a good sales price and walk away from the existing lease and so forth. Um, with the mall blessing, you know, the ability to get get out from under it. But that's a good point. You know, if I if we had been gung-ho, too emotionally attached, um, we might have uh, hung in there. We might have, you know, waited too long to go back to the mall to say, hey, we want to renew our lease, only to find out they weren't going to give it to us, for example, and then we would have been holding on to a bag of nothing. Uh, so... Another lesson there might have been we should have had a longer than seven year lease to start with, but I don't think they were willing to give us that anyway. So you got to deal with the cards you're given sometimes, and we, you know, we we get out of that good. But if we had thought about that with the the travel business, we might have been, you know, we might have been looking for an exit plan to sell the whole thing before Facebook made those changes. It might have been a home run, <laughs> <laughs> leaving the headache to somebody else. <laughs> And, and do you think that was a, a mistake that you didn't maybe foresee the the those the level of impact it was going to have? Yeah, absolutely, it was. But you know, it's kind of like you, none of us can see the future, so we didn't. Um, at least we weren't privy to how bad. And as far as we know, ninety nine percent of the rest of the internet marketers at the time were not either aware of. Only Apple probably knew just how devastating this was going to be to the, you know, Facebook ad structure. And I doubt they cared, right? Apple and Facebook aren't necessarily tied at the hip. So no. why would Apple care how much money uh, Zuckerberg makes, you know? And uh, they were worried about providing their members with more privacy. And their members would appreciate the privacy, even though their members no longer saw the ads that were relevant to them anymore. So you know we 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 hate marketers, right? We're like, oh, these damn ads come up, and I hate ads. But guess what? You know, nothing happens in the world until somebody buys something, and many of those things we buy 
are products and services and tools that can positively affect your life and can positively affect your business. But as an Apple user, you may never even be aware of a lot of the things that are out there because you're you're selected to you know not be promoted to, not get mm. uh, advertising promotions on your Apple device. And uh, well, good for you. You don't see the ads. You don't spend the money. But who knows what you're, you may or may not be actually missing out on that could have been, uh, uh, in, you know, products and services improve our lives. Otherwise, we'd still be in the dark ages and none of us would have internet, none of us would have a telephone, none of us would have a computer, none of us would we'd still, you know, all of us today are richer than any, any anywhere in the world. We are richer today than we were 100 years ago. Mm. Uh, and then why is that? Because we all have better lifestyle with better products and better services. And part of the cost of that is the quote unquote privacy, you know. Mm. Um, I, th I think it felt like the dark ages before the internet, definitely. And um, <laughs> um, you said that you you kind of pivoted your way out of, of that uh, downturn. How, how did you manage to do that? Well, one of the ways that we got out of that was switching our business over to supporting business to be going B2B. And we launched, and let me tell you this story first, is this really cool. Uh, when we had the book VIP, you know, we still do, but one of the things that we wanted, and this started prior to this whole Facebook uh, debacle, but um, we wanted video reviews. We kept thinking to ourselves, man, if we only had more video testimonials from our clients that were selling travel, right? We're selling hotels, resorts, beautiful resorts around the world. So we're like, if we only had more video testimonials from people on the beaches of the world bragging about the hotel, bragging about our brand, we'd be able to leverage those all over our website, on our Facebook ads, on our YouTube ads, on, and turn those into thousands of more sales. But we couldn't get hardly anybody to do it, to go that extra mile and film a selfie review. Excuse me. So we came up with an idea to offer a, um, a bonus trip, a bonus three night getaway in Orlando or Las Vegas uh, while they were, uh, if they would give us that video testimonial. But here's how we did it, Jazz, and here's a good lesson for anybody listening. If you're still on this show at this point, here's a really good value bomb to use for any business out there. And that is we all need more reviews. We all need more testimonials. We all need more social proof. And one of the ways to do it that we found super effective was to do a survey when we felt our client was at their peak of happiness which in our case was the day after they checked into the hotel. So we'd send them an email and text message the day after they check into the hotel and ask them, hey, can you give us a star rating, one to five? How is the hotel you're, you're experiencing living up to your expectations? How is our brand, how have we done so far with our product and service? And if they gave us a four or five, great. We were instantly with our automation sending them emails and text messages going, Please help us do us a huge favor and help us spread the word about this hotel you're enjoying. And if you would go the extra mile and film a selfie testimonial, brag about the hotel, show you, it, you know, in the hotel behind you, whatever you like best, and mention our brand, we're going to reward you with a complimentary hotel stay three nights in Orlando or Las Vegas as a bonus. Well, boom, suddenly we started getting dozens of these reviews in and then hundreds and then we had to turn off the campaign because, of course, when we had to give away those three nights in Orlando or, or Las Vegas, it was expensive. <laughs> so then we thought, how could we keep this going? This is fantastic. We were let those those testimonials. We were putting them all over our website, generating hundreds of more transactions. So we went back to our hotel partners in Orlando and Vegas and said, "Listen, guys, you guys have a problem, and we figured out a way to help you solve it. Let's be honest: your hotel's not full year round." You've got, sure, you're sold out on certain weekends, peak seasons, uh, holidays. But the majority of the year, 60%, 70% of the year, you've got 30%, 40%, 50% of your room sitting empty. Yet you still have the same fixed cost, mortgage payments, front deck staff, et cetera. So if you'll give us access to those empty rooms, we'll put warm bodies in those rooms that are going to hopefully, likely, spend money at the restaurant, the bar, the gift shop, the excursion desk, the casino, room service. Maybe they'll book extra nights, upgrade room types. And so we got a few hotels to participate in Orlando and Vegas. So then we could go back to giving them away as a bonus free if they gave us a video review. Well, by the way, that website 
bookvip.com has over 30,000 video testimonials wow. today, more than any other travel website in the world. And that's how it started and how, you know, we get those reviews. So then we thought to ourselves, boy, can you imagine if we had dozens of hotels or hundreds of hotels like this participating all over the world, giving us their excess inventory, and, and we could give them away in a private community where, where uh, you know, the outside world doesn't know about these complimentary hotel rooms? We'd have another standalone business, which is what eventually became the business I run today that I'm most excited about. I'm passionate about it. I do it every, you know, get up in the morning, fired up about it. That's called Marketing Boost where we provide business owners with these travel incentives, they can use just to enhance whatever their call to action is. They can give away three nights all the way to seven night stays in places like Orlando, Las Vegas, uh, Cancun, Mexico, Cabo, Phuket, Thailand, Bali. They don't include airfare, food and beverage, or government taxes and fees, but these incentives can be used to enhance whatever call to action is. And then we have restaurant incentives and hotel savings cards. And those three categories, we teach business owners how to how to include them as bonuses to enhance whatever their call to action is. And we have, you know, dozens of case studies. We've helped thousands of business owners. We serve thousands of business owners in myriad of ways to acquire more leads and close more sales. Sorry for the pitch there, but it that's no, really no, what it sounds is actually a fantastic idea. So what do you think? Um you had two thousand and eight, which is obviously really challenging for you. And then obviously you've had this moment in your business where you know it was it was potentially at risk and you obviously had to make some difficult decisions in the end how do you, did you manage to get through those periods of of difficulty i'm just trying to get inside you, your i suppose your methods uh, and your mindset a little bit because yeah it's uh it's some you've gone through a quite a you know, some significant setbacks there. And I'm just wondering how you managed to cope personally with that. That's a good question. I'll tell you, in 2008, um, that was probably the biggest shakeup in my life, 2008, 2009, thinking I'm uh, I'm set, doing great. I'm executive vice president of a major, major huge travel company um, and find myself fired and then not able, I thought, I'll bounce back. I will land, you know, vertically with another big company. But, you know, so many resumes later and, and years and a half later, nothing's coming my way. The business that I had on the side was failing as well, left and right, changing and trying to modify my business every which way to survive with my business and only digging into savings there, losing that, um, and went from... From living in that, you know, neighborhood to essentially living in a motel in Miami and actually, actually, uh, Hollywood, Florida, in a motel in on the beach for paying, you know, week to week. Um, separated from my wife, kids are on their own. I was like, it it really tore up, you know, the whole family, and uh, feeling like a mega victim. Um, in my mid forties here, late forties, going, why me? Why now? How can I be starting over? And I left Orlando where I was living because I, I could not, and I don't like telling this story. Honestly, it obviously brings back a lot of bad memories. But in other words, I, uh, you know, went from being what I thought was very well off. I was in those top one percent of the world's income earners, to, to nothing. You know for years and having it disappear and dry up little by little. And then I left Orlando because I could not hold my hat in my hand. I was not willing, after being an executive of a big company in a relatively small community, I did not, I couldn't hold my hat in hand to go get some starter job and start over. And so I moved to, you know, Southwest, I mean, South uh, Florida. And I was, you know, uh, door-to-door sales again and do whatever it takes to get back on my feet. But during that time, the victim mentality was I was drinking a lot. I was uh, not healthy. I mean, I was, my mindset was destroyed on why me, why now, how do I start over, do I start over, you know, and blaming everybody but me, you know, and um thinking maybe it's, you know, 
be choosing to be is it is it racism is it because i'm hispanic you know again la- la- latching on to any excuse until i realized okay this is this is mindset man you know better you know you know how to go back to how, how to win friends and influence people you know how to go back to the books you know how to read brian tracy you know how to read sales you know you've been there before you know how to make money you know how to build a business uh get off your ass and go make something happen and uh i mean i'm embarrassed to say this but i was my late 40s jazz waiting tables at night back to the business i knew which was the restaurant business Mm -hmm. waiting tables at night at the highest restaurant i could be hired at you know as far as high-end restaurant to earn the most uh, tips and so on and and which was incredibly humiliating to go back to that at that age. Uh, if you can only imagine, yeah. uh, after being an owner and doing what I was doing, to go back to just holding my hat in the hand and being a waiter, man, was crushing. Crushing. No, absolutely. I'm sure. I'm sure. I mean, it sounds. Uh, it sounds really. Well, tough's not the right word. Tough's not doesn't really do it justice. Um, I mean, but I bounced back. You, how did you go? Yeah, I mean, how? Yeah, how did but, you manage to bounce back from that? But, but that? I bounced back. I bounced back because I'm not. A, I knew I wasn't a quitter, and I knew. I knew deep down, it's not. It's not. No one's picking on me. No one's picking me out because I'm Hispanic. I knew deep down that I'm that United States of America, and forgive me for being biased because I'm here and I'm proud to be an American. You know, in my mind, this is the this is the home of the American dream. I'm bilingual. I'm good looking. But in other words, I'm like, I can do it and I can get do it again. And I set out to do that. And uh you know, door-to-door sales, selling PR, which was not easy to do back in 2008, and start uh, work my way into a marketing position at another major company, and and within a few months, I was traveling all over the world again, marketing, at, rather selling um, uh, technology, streaming technology for you know uh, all of the over-the-top providers like uh, uh, you know the uh, what's the Roku's and stuff like that of the world and what have you. And uh, turned it right, turned it around. And then before you know it, I decided to bounce from that and form some the, my partners again. And then I talked to you about it. And we launched bookvip.com. Um, and the story's, you know, taken off from there again. And mm. I'm, I've come back way beyond what I was back in 20, uh, 2007 to being a hell of a lot more secure with, a, with additional lessons learned on how to, you know, not be... Um, you know, some people make oh, out. One of my mistakes back then was, you know, you you spend as much money as you make, almost, right? You know, you're when you're young and you've got teenage kids and you live in that in the community. You know, it's about the lifestyle, it's about the boat, it's about the seven cars in the driveway. And yeah, I had reserves, but you know, should have been investing a lot more of it instead of you know keeping up with the Joneses. So the mistake too many young people make, if you're listening to this and you're not as old as I am, if you're as old as me, you might be in deep trouble already if you haven't figured it out. But when you're young, you know, you don't need the fancy car with a $1,000 a month payment and plus insurance. You know, you need you need wheels, but you don't need to have something that's so expensive that you're you're stressing every month just to pay bills. You need to be stressing to build the business. You need to be stressing to put money in investments and have delayed gratification for the toys and the, you know, build enough wealth that when you start buying toys and, you know, stop the show off uh, mentality. Not that I was in the show off world. I really wasn't. But 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 we were, you know, we were driving fancier cars than they needed to be driving. We were, you know, I, I that if I had had more money available to me, that that uh, transition wouldn't have been so painful. So uh, it'll dry up really quick with things that are out of your control, and you never know when that's coming. Well, thank you for uh, sharing that uh, that journey. 
uh, and some of that, you know, those tough memories. So just going to wrap up um, uh, with a final question. If you could go back in time and erase 2008, you just that story you just told, and the 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 kind of mo- the um, the debt that you had with Facebook and the, all of the, the the changes in privacy with with Apple that we we discussed and the impact that that had on your business and all of the, the tough decisions you needed to make, all the layoffs. If you could erase all of that from ever happening in your life, would you take it? The Facebook one, no, because that was a, a learning curve that took us down another business route that is more fulfilling to me now. And I help, I serve now, I get the benefit now that I get to serve thousands of business owners and reach back. It wouldn't have probably wouldn't have happened if, if Book VAP hadn't have stuttered. So because we stuttered with Book VAP, we had the opportunity to pivot and build a new business. And that new business is much more fulfilling to me than selling directly to consumer. Helping other business owners succeed every day is, is, it fills me because I've been there and I've seen the rough times and uh, it's my passion. Um, so I wouldn't get rid of the Facebook situation. I would gladly, <laughs> I would love to have erased what happened in 2008 uh, 2009, et cetera, that was, um, uh, you know, shocked the world, right? And it hurt many of us mm. more than others, but I wasn't, uh, I wasn't prepared for it. So, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't erase it. I mean, I would love to erase 2008 if I could, absolutely. And I would have loved to have gone back a little further in time and told my younger self, prepare yourself better for the unknowns and make sure you have more money diversified, more investments made, less of it stretched on credit leverage, you know, less lever- uh, credit leveraging and make sure you're, you know, cash, uh, cash positive, you know, yeah. as much as possible. And I think um, there's a great lesson there uh, in terms of what you just talked about, uh, diversification of, uh, I suppose, of, of income and investments and things like that, as well as you know, we talked about diversification uh, in terms of lead generation and marketing as well. And and I would say that's, you know, good advice for any business owner, entrepreneur is, you know, it is all about managing your risk through diversification. So we always end with a quick fire round. Uh, this is short questions and short answers. Um, so question one, failure is? Not being prepared. What's your life's mission? My mission today is to guide and help other entrepreneurs along that sometimes very lonely journey of being an entrepreneur. What's one piece of advice that you would want to give to others on your deathbed? Piece of advice to give to others on your best deathbed. You know, nothing nothing really matters more than relationships. Um, Hold on to them, build them. Um, but not at all costs. Sometimes loved ones can expect more than is, um, you know, it's got to be a relationship of, of respect and love and you need both. So, but at the end of the day, you know, we're, we're not taking any money with us. So the relationships is what, and the memories are what count. So work on those. What's one habit that keeps you resilient? Gratitude. Every morning, I uh, start my morning very early with a cup of coffee, some very soft music in the background. Start with a list of you know grat- of gratitude and reading. So I'll read for forty five to an hour in the morning while I'm still fresh, and I'll read very different books and then shut the book down and get started at work. But um, I would strongly recommend that to help set your mindset for the day based on gratitude because although I have a quick temper, I have to tell you just honestly, I've, this is a, I'm, I could probably have been using anger management all my life. So easily I get set off on different things, but I'm trying to, I'm still learning to do this better and better, which is I can't be grateful and angry at the same time. So if I can maintain a heart of a mindset of gratitude, then I can control the little things that set me off 
like when mm-hmm. the app won't work on my phone or the computer gets stuck. Or yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, that's great advice. If you could be immortal, would you take it? Probably. <laughs> <laughs> Who doesn't want to stay immortal? No. Um, shoot. Yeah, that's a good question. I would, yeah, I don't, since I don't know what's beyond, I would say, yeah, I would take immortal, immortality for sure. And what's one surprising fact that not many people know about you? I love dancing. And so I do ballroom dancing for fun. And I love, uh, I'm on my way to Argentina here pretty soon so I can learn to tango. Amazing. And who can you recommend that you think I should have on as a guest? I have, uh, uh, could I guess uh, something comes to mind here? I have to look up their name right now, but I'm thinking of somebody who's a speech coach um, who is really good about how to deliver the message with how you talk and speak. And I can share. I don't know about her failure stories, but I'm sure she's probably had some. Great. No, thank you for that. Fantastic. Marco, where can people find you and connect with you? Find me at marketingboostsolutions.com, marketingboostsolutions.com and or marketingboost.com. There we have links to our Facebook groups. We have one of our main groups of over 30,000 entrepreneurs. Uh, that are all kind of helping each other grow. And and uh, we also, on Marketing Boost Solutions, we have our own podcast show as well, Jez, de- dedicated to helping business owners down that journey of um, being an entrepreneur. Brilliant. Well, I'll put all that in the show notes. Um, so, Marco, thank you so much for, for being here and for sharing all of those challenges and difficult moments. And um, I know a lot of people will get a lot of value out of today. So thank you very much. You're very welcome, Jez, and I'll refer you to Dr. Laura, and I forget her last name, but she would be a good guest for you. Perfect. Thank you for listening to Beyond the Fail. Really hope you enjoyed this episode and learned something new. Please do subscribe to the show and leave us a review. It really does help us to grow and to reach more people. Do follow us on social media too. We're at Jeswood on Instagram and at Beyond the Fail on YouTube and also on Linktree. Thanks again and see you soon.